uh, to begin with, let's all join in and have a small word of prayer. Gracious God in heaven, want to thank you, Lord. As we open your word, we want your presence to go with us. Uh, grant your mercies. Give us wisdom and knowledge from above so that we might be able to understand. And, O oh, Father, with your help, we might be able to walk in it. May thine will be done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. spotlight we have today is entitled as Farmers Plants Churches. Farmer Plants Churches. A Seventh-day Adventist minister asked Wang Wang Ming, a farmer with no theological training, to help plant a church in a small village located in a two and a half hours drive from his home in southern Taiwan. When Ming was surprised, he wasn't a church member, but he worshipped every Sabbath in his own village. He agreed to help. He spoke with the church members who had a female relative in other village. Ba Yi O, where no Adventists lived. These are a group of community. There were no Adventists. But she gave permission to start a house church in her home. Wen Ming and the pastor took turns preaching in a house every Sabbath. And six people were baptized in six months. Over a half year after then, Wen Ming himself was baptized. Adventist leaders were impressed that God had blessed Wen Ming's efforts in southern Taiwan, a region where the church had struggled to make inroads. The Taiwan conference asked him to plant a church in another southern village. Six years later, the church was prospering and Wen Ming was asked to reopen the church in another place. For the first time, Wen Ming was worried. He thought about his lack of theological training. But he prayed. Two people showed up on the first Sabbath and then Wen Ming uh, responded. And uh, we had a lot of people been able to come to him. Wen Ming reopened the church's door. He encouraged the two worshippers to often to open their homes. And then late later, on Friday evening program, he invited them to attend the church service. The next day, after eight years, the church had nearly 74 members. After 17 years of planting churches, Wen Ming said the secret is to follow Christ's method alone which Ellen White describes this way. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he begged them fall away. When being 75, said he tries to meet people's needs. He bought mangoes, watermelons, and guavas, from his farm for a fellowship meal every Sabbath. After three years, worshippers began to follow his example. The young pastor who replaced Wen Ming as the leader asked with astonishment, how did you grow this church? How can I grow a church like you did? Show mercy, be patient, be humble, and love others. And that's what the way how Wen Ming said, just be like Jesus. Don't you think so? A non theological person or now who could be able to win souls for Christ never knew about the Bible. And later on, he was baptized after six months when he started his ministry. Wow! I want to challenge you today, each one of us, my dear brothers and sisters, wherever you might be watching online. If you and I could be able to commit ourselves to the hands of Jesus Christ, He can certainly use us. I think so, we are far better uh, than this person called Wen Ming. 
We are equipped with God's word. We have resources. God has given us health, breath. He has given us understanding. We have everything. What is there to stop for not winning souls for Christ? That's the question to be asked by every individual as we contemplate on this uh, mission, this story. And we are here in uh, lesson two, uh, with the Sabbath school lesson, entitled as Covenant Primer. Covenant Primer. The days are, you know, we are really going through very fast. I can't just imagine we are in the second week of April. And uh, God is so gracious to each one of us. He has helped each one of us to be a part of this ministry. And today, we are going to look into the covenant a relationship that the Lord has been able to show to us. A beautiful lesson. Uh, it is uh, uh, quite a very common one, but we have a depth of meaning that we can be able to understand about it. The memory text is taken from Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. It says, Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. You see, when the Lord is speaking, when he makes a statement, when he says something, there is a depth of meaning in it. It goes on to say that all the earth is his, where Satan claimed to be the prince of this earth by deception. But here, God is saying, originally this is mine. Everything which is there on this earth is mine. So what he says, you and I are living in the territory of God, even though Satan has claimed this earth to be his. And he says, in this earth where Satan has claimed himself to be the prince of this earth, he says, I want to make you very peculiar. I want you to be my treasure. I want you to be able to be used by me. I have a plan and I have an arrangement be made. I want you to make sure, will you be able to cooperate with me? Which means it simply says we have to be cooperative to the heaven verse in order to be a peculiar treasure in the hand of God. So this week we are going to look into the fall of humanity because of our first prayer in sin. And the whole summary is that the whole quarter, what we're going to learn is that, that each day we look at the early covenants where God had been made to his children way back in the past. And the ones that they're on their way, the covenants are there on their way. And of course, uh, if you have to go a little bit further, the one covenant that I can be able to remember is about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. A covenant made at the first in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 was ratified at the cross of Calvary. And the whole uh, week, we are going to look into the covenant uh, which was God made to Noah. And he spared him in every angle and his family from the destruction that God had instilled during the anti -Duvalians. And then we proceed to the covenant with Abraham, God made and called him out of the land of Ur. And with the rich promises through him that we all can be benefited. And then go on a little bit further and then come to Mount Sinai. When God made a covenant with his people through Moses by giving the Decalogue or the moral law or the Ten Commandments. And then finally, we look into that new covenant that Jesus came 
and died on the cross of Calvary. The first covenant which was made in the book of Genesis to Adam and Eve. Yes, all of these we can be able to study in depth over the next several weeks. This week is just a preview of what this covenant is all about. Okay, let's go to the basic question. A very, very, very basic question. What is a covenant? And that's the way how we be able to go about. What is a covenant? We hear this word called covenant from Genesis to Revelation. What is this covenant mean? Welcome, Sister Mary. Very happy. Okay. Praise we missed you for two weeks, though. Praise God. <laughs> So we missed you for prayer, but we missed you for two weeks. You say praise God. Okay. Yeah, physically, I was not here, but mentally and yeah. spiritually, I was here. Very happy, very happy that God, in His own infinite mercy, that He's got Amen. you back again. Amen. What do you think so covenant is all about? Have you ever questioned? Because in Genesis chapter 17, verse 2, if you have to look into that, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. Okay, this covenant was made to Abraham, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the Hebrew word for this word called covenant most probably appears nearly about 287 times in the Old Testament alone. Okay. How many times? 287 times in the Old Testament. And the original meaning of this covenant means uh, berit. Berit has a very important meaning. And it can also be translated as a testament we have the new testament right mm -hmm. what is that again testament means it is connected with covenant and testament or you can be able to say it is the last will will of god its origin most probably of what covenant is all about might be very much unclear but the very important aspect of what this covenant means is that it is the will of god or you can say it is a testament or it is something to do with you know give and take if i have to put it in a, a very simpler way but it has come to mean that which bounds two parties together covenant means having two parties coming together with an ultimatum that's what it means to say or we can be able to use this in a very different types of bond, just like a bond between a man and woman. A covenantial relationship, a man and a woman, or from a man to a man. Or we have two parties, distinctively so religious, and they can be able to come in together in a common understanding or a covenantial relationship okay and that's what it means to say a covenant means uh, it is a bondage or it is a type of testament it is an agreement it is a relationship between two people that's what covenant is all about any question in this regard we can simply put it as a relationship bound together. When you talk about the covenant in the Old Testament, you will be able to find that uh, it is a metaphor based on a common use, but it had a deeper connotation, okay, which creates a, 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 a beautiful union between two people. Either it might be husband and wife, a covenant relationship is called as marriage, or a relationship with God and you okay and you make an agreement with him and that is called as covenant like the marriage covenant the biblical covenant defines both a relationship and an arrangement you see covenant means what's the covenant that's what the basic thing we are looking about it is an arrangement made okay for a relationship that what this covenant is all about Okay, as an arrangement, the biblical covenant contains three basic elements. When we talk about covenant, there are three basic elements. Number one, if you have to look into Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, 
and Hebrews chapter 6 verse 13 and 17 you'll be able to find that God's affirmed the covenant promise with an oath so a covenant comes with an oath what happens in marriage what does the pastor do he takes an oath from both the person who's supposed to be husband and wife and is that oath necessary yes I said, do you love your husband? Uh, do, do, do you take this man as what? Your husband. And the girl has to say, yes, I do. And we turn to the boy and say, will you take this woman as your beloved wife? Yes, I do. And then again, we'll be able to turn up and say, in, in, in goodness, in sickness, in everything, I will love her, cherish her. She says, yes, I do. Okay, and here, the past asks and say, okay, will you be able to cherish her in goodness, in sickness? Yes, I do. And then again, we'll be able to come and say, most probably, uh, that uh, all the wealth which belongs to you, even belongs to her. Will you agree? Yes, I do. And then later on, what we will say? Okay, both of them agreed. That's an oath. That's an oath. Both of them agree. It's an arrangement made. And they agree for all this one. Most probably, even they will sign the contract. Do you remember? Arrangement, agreement for a relationship. It's an oath. That's the first basic principle of covenant. The second covenantal obligation was obedience to God's will will be expressed in the Ten Commandments. When you make a covenant, you make an oath with God and say, Yes, Lord, I agree for everything that you are going to do for me. At the same time, I want to make sure that the oath that I have taken to follow you in every angle, I will try to keep it. Number two is saying that there is an obligation of obedience. What is the obedience? The Ten Commandments. God has given. The Bible says it very clearly. If you love me, keep my commandments. Okay, so what? We are assuring God, stating that, if you if if you are expecting me to be a part of me or if you are expecting me to be a part of you and then i will certainly be able to keep that decalogue the ten commandments which means obedience to god's will is expressed in the ten commandments number three a covenant relationship means by which god's covenant obligation is ultimately fulfilled through christ plan of salvation you see accepting the plan of salvation the ultimatum or the end is God has planned a way on this earth to make sure that we enjoy the best at the end and you accept it and say yes I'm marching forward towards that you see covenantial relationship number one we have an oath Number two, comes obedience. Number three, the plan of salvation. Very important. These are the three elements that we can find in a covenantial relationship. In the Old, sister, in the Old Testament, the sacrificial system of types instructed the people regarding the entire plan of salvation through the symbol and the patriarchs. And Israel learned to exercise faith in the coming Redeemer. We know the sanctuary service, right? God gave through Moses to the children of Israel. What is that? That is the plan of salvation given through Moses okay, to the children of Israel. And that is the way how it is going to happen. In the New Testament, that was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And, uh, and he is the plan of salvation for each one of us. And the Old Testament covenant is the fulfill uh, the new testament covenant is the fulfillment of the old covenantial promise okay and that's what the covenant means any any, any question in this figure it is very simple i made it as simple as possible very simple and uh, we have to understand the three concepts of what covenant is all about any question anyone who's watching online Okay, you have any questions as a fancy, you know, please can ask and uh, we can be able to go ahead. It should not be a problem. Okay, let's come to the Monday's part of the lesson. It is called as the covenant with Noah. What was the covenant, do you think so, he made with Noah? 
The basic principle, if you have to go, look into Genesis chapter 6, verse 18. That the beautiful is said that, but with thee will I establish my covenant. He's telling to Noah. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. Why is he calling what Noah? He said he's making the covenantial relationship, he's taking the oath, he's calling for obedience, the three elements what we saw, right? And he said, I want my covenant to be established between my testament, my arrangements with you, my relationship with you. So if you want me to have that relationship with you, obey. What is that obedience? Come into the ark. Be saved. You see, in the above verses, uh, you know, the word covenant appears for the first time in the Bible. And in the context, God just told Noah about the decision that he wants to destroy this earth. Why do you want to destroy this earth? Why was he willing to destroy this earth? Just for us. Because of the massive, continuing spread of sin. Where did this sin come from? All the way from heaven, pour down to this earth, Adam and Eve succumbed, and there till Noah, 2,000 long years, everybody had it what? Being a part of sin, don't know where to go, how to go about it, and God was so much displeased, and he said, okay, enough is enough. I don't want to go forward, but I want to make my covenant being kept, so what I will do? I will save. So who will be saved? Only the person who is willing to obey my instructions. Because of the massive and the continuing spread of sin, through the destruction will come in a worldwide flood. God is not forsaking the world he created. No. He continues to offer the covenantial relationship first to set in operation after the fall. So what he does? When he says that I am that I am, he simply says that I don't want everybody to be destroyed. I want you to be a part of this covenant, but nobody wanted to listen to him. And because only Noah gave his full authority over God and said, yes, Lord, I am willing to oblige myself to be a part of you. Yes. As the covenant keeping God, and the Lord promised to protect the family members who are willing to live in a committed relationship with him. Uh, one that resulted in obedience was Noah and his family. If our family has to continually be saved by his grace, if you want God to keep his promise in our lives, in our family's life, be obedient just like Noah was obedient in every angle. Obedience comes and then comes the promise. No obedience, no promise. That's what we learn with Noah. So that, that's the reason God tells Noah that there is going to be a flood and the whole world will be destroyed. But God makes a deal with him. That deal is the covenant that he has been able to go through uh, Abraham and his uh, uh, you know, children. God makes a deal with him in which he promises to save Noah and his family just because of obedience. And that's the reason in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, the Bible says it very clearly that obedience is better than sacrifice. And God has planned a plan of salvation for every individual, but a very important thing that he's trying to tell to each one of us is that obey. The whole fulcrum of the biblical message is this. Obey and live or disobey and die. And that's what we could find in the flood story. And that's one of the reasons that we find that. He promises to save Noah and his family. Thus the stakes were quite very high because God did not uphold his end of the promise that no matter what Noah did, 
he would be wiped out with the rest of the world until unless he would have been succumbed to listen to God's word in every and you see God's word is so important we are living in this very last days of time sister Mary I'm telling you this world is not going to last for a long time the same way how God destroyed the whole world and he is coming again for destruction because we could see you know sin is being overthrown every day and this is the time God wants to keep his promises. But if you have to go to the antediluvians during the time of Noah, they were reluctant. They were unable to accept Noah and his family. And they were saved. And today God is calling you and me. You and me. To be special treasures in his hand. Yes. What is the decision that we can be able to make? Because God said he would make a covenant. The word itself implies an intention to honor what want to say or will to do. It is not just some whimsical statement. The word itself comes with loaded with commitment. Suppose the Lord had said to Noah, look, the world is going to end in a terrible deluge and I might save you or I might not. In the meantime, do this and this and this and this. No, he didn't say that. He simply said, Noah, I want to make a commitment with you that you obey me, I will save you. It is a promise. It is a stern promise. And it's the same stern promise with you and me in this last days in a covenantal relationship. Any question in this regard? That was the covenant which God made with Noah in Monday's lesson. And God saved Noah? Yes. Yes, he saved Noah. Was he blessed? Yes, he was blessed. And the whole earth was populated because of Noah, and we are part of Noah's because of Noah. Let's get into the Tuesday's part of the lesson. It is called as once Noah came into existence and there was flood and Noah was rescued and the project continued and filled the earth and then comes from then to this great man called Abraham. Before he could become Abraham, he was Abraham, okay, the father of all Christianity. And then he says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, what does he say? He simply says, and I will bless them that bless you. And cursed they, okay, who curseth you. And in thee all families of this earth will be blessed. Wow! If God has told me that, hey, Pastor Jeffrey, I will bless the person whom you bless. I'm going to curse the person whom you're going to curse. What a favorable personality was Abraham. And even he lived in not in a favorable condition at all. No. He lived in a very unfavorable condition at every angle. But God saw the potential in Abraham for his obedience. He pursued. And don't ever forget, you and I have become Christians not just that way. No. He has seen the potential, what you saw in Abraham. He has seen in you, in you, in you, in you, in each one of us. And then only he has called us into his treasure. And he gives an important uh, okay, notice to Abraham. And he says it very clearly that I want to make sure uh, that I want to bless you in every angle. In the first record of divine revelation to Abraham, God promised to enter into the close and the lasting relationship with him even before he used any language that spoke about the covenant making. And uh, you know, God offered a divine human relationship of great significance. He repeated that I will, I will, I will, I will. Which means he suggests that the depths and the greatness of God's offer and promise to Abraham. In addition, Abraham received a single but testing command. Go forth. What did God say to Abraham? Go. Where to go? Don't know. He should leave his kindred, family, everybody. He simply said, go. And he started going. What a faith, right? Mm -hmm. If God comes and tells to us, I want, to, I, I, want, I want to pose you a very uh, a, a, a question uh, which thought provokes in every individual. If God says to you and me, suddenly, this night, I want to leave your house and go, I'll be ready. <laughs> it is a difficult question. You know, sometimes, uh, 
it, it, it doesn't make sense. When somebody comes in the middle of the night and say, leave this place and go. Hey, I've lived in this place for a long period of time. I have a mortgage to pay. I have to do this. And this is the place where God had given me. Will he be able to say to go now? Would have stood there, asked a lot of questions, started to reason it out in every angle. And most probably, I don't know what we would have decided. Okay, I don't know. But this man, he left everything and started going to a place where he didn't know. In fact, I preached a sermon on this. I don't know whether you can live one. Okay. And then, but Abraham already believed in God. He left and God said, I'm going to establish you. And that's the reason in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 8, right? Bible records about Abraham, a man of faith. And today, he is called as the father of faith. And God anticipates that's the implicit obedience and faith in him. When he says, move on, move on. That is the beauty. And no wonder, it is the covenant. It is reciprocal. It was the obedience of Abraham and it is the promise of God. You see both working together. And that's what this covenant is all about. You agree upon. It's a mutual contract. God said, you obey me, I'm going to excel you in every angle. Anybody who blesses you, I will bless. Anybody who curses you, I will be able to curse you. That's the way how we say it. And that's a promise made to Abraham. And then what happened? And it was fulfilled. He had to, otherwise he never would have left his family and his ancestral land to begin with the head into a place unknown. His obedience revealed his faith both to men and to angels. That's what it says. Abraham, even back then, revealed the key relationship between faith and works. We are saved by faith and faith that results in work of obedience. The promise of salvation comes first. The works follows. Although there can be no covenant fellowship and no blessings without obedience, that obedience in faith, faith's response to what God's already has done. Such faith illustrates the principle which is recorded in 1 John chapter 4 verse 19. We love him or we love God because he first loved us in every angle of our life. That is the beauty. That is the beauty. That is the faith, that is the hope that you and I have to possess in every angle as we get into know who this great God is all about. So we saw the covenant with Noah and we saw the covenant with Abraham, all both were reciprocal. Noah obeyed God and he was saved and Abraham obeyed God and he was saved. So it simply means that obedience comes first before any promises has to be fulfilled. So faith comes first and then works follows. That's what it means to say. Any question in this regard? Okay, let's go a little bit further on the Wednesday's lesson. Sister Pansy, if you have any question, you can just interrupt me anytime. I'll be happy. We'll go to the Wednesday's part of the lesson, which is talking about the covenant with Moses. Wow, Moses, the great leader, is here. We read that in Exodus chapter 6, verse 1 to 8, uh, uh, the fulfillment of God's uh, covenant with the children of Israel. What is that covenant? What is that covenant? He said, I will raise up a person that he will be able to lead you into the promised land. Moses comes into the picture. 120 years. Okay. Moses toyed for 40 long years with the children of Israel, guided them in the wilderness according to God's plan. Of course, Moses was unable to okay, make it through because of a whole lot of things. But still, Moses becomes the great man and God says, you are fit to be in heaven. He takes him up okay, to heaven. That's a different question. But after the Exodus, the children of Israel received the covenant at Sinai, given in the context of redemption from bondage. What does the Bible say? If you have to go to the book of Exodus chapter 20, you'll be able to understand. At Mount Sinai, God gave the Ten Commandments or the Decalogue or the Moral Law for the children of Israel. Why was it given? He said that if you, you have been relieved from the bondage, they were there for how many long years? 400 long years as the children of bondage in Egypt. 
God relieved them from bondage and is calling for a covenantial relationship with him by giving the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments where God has been able to give to the children of Israel, God is taking an initiation and says, okay, you are there in bondage, I have relieved you now. I want to make sure that I want to enjoy the relationship from now on with you and me forever. But provided you follow the precepts or the Ten Commandments, he gave them. Yes, in many ways, this covenant retaliated the major emphasis in the covenant with Abraham. And don't ever forget, it was a special relationship of God to his people. And they would be a great nation, he said. And obedience was required. <laughs> the beauty where God wants to establish to be a part with his children is so amazing, Sister Mary. It's so amazing. But the problem with human beings is we never understood God at all from the beginning till today. He's always making a constant attempt to be a part of us, to bless us, to keep his promises. But what is happening with you and me? You and I have not been allowing God to fulfill his promises in our lives, in our family's life, in our social life, because we are unable to trust him and march forward the way God wants to. Yeah. We become grumblers, we become complainers. Every time we are not satisfied, we are becoming so negative. We are not being able to, you know, you talk about the children of Israel and comparing our lives in this 21st century. We are no better than them. We only talk about faith, but when it comes to a real exercising of faith, we are gone. That's the tragic story of humanity. But the beauty is this, in spite of that, God has not got fed up between you and me. We have got fed up of God for the goodness that he has showed to us. But he has never been fed up of you and me. Why? Because he already promised with Noah. He already promised with Abraham. He already promised at the Mount Sinai. Stating that I want to. It is not that we want God. No, actually we don't want God. What happened to the children of Israel? What happened? When Moses, when he had the ten you know, uh, commandments with a tablet of stone, what were the children of Israel doing? Worshipping. They were worshipping idols. And what were they saying? This calf is the one who got us all the way from Egypt to what an abomination to God. When God is constantly trying his level best to reinstate the fallen humanity to get back to him and put us back on the track of the plan of salvation. But what is happening with humanity? We are not falling in track with God's plan of salvation. That is the tragedy of humanity. That is the tragedy of humanity. God is simply telling, if I have to put it in a very simple way, God is telling, hey, you are in a crocodile's mouth. I'm here to rescue you. You know, just cooperate with me and I will be able to get you from the mouth of crocodile. We don't know as human beings, very few minutes from now, we are all going into the crocodile's stomach. We don't know. We think that everything is fine. God is trying his level best to get us out. Don't you think so? We have to cooperate with him. The history reveals every time. History reveals very time that the children of Israel were always became a failure in the hands of God. Mm -hmm. That is the very bad part of it. In this covenant of, with Moses and Mount Sinai, it is asking for a special relationship with God to his people. There would be a great nation if you obey me, that's what he says. And obedience is a must. If you have to note here, the Lord first saves Israel. He first saves Israel from the bondage, right? Mm -hmm. And then what does he do? And then gives him the law to keep. The same order is true under the gospel. 
Christ first saves us from sin and then he asks us to live out that his law is within us and that's the reason the Bible says it very clearly that in the last days I'm going to put my laws and my statutes in your heart. First he saves and then he gives the promise. Without saving relationship, he will never do that. So if you and I have been called for this one, you and I have to make sure in every aspect of our life, honor what God has planned and prepared for you and me. Okay, covenant given to Abraham, number one. Number two, covenant given to Abraham. Uh, sorry, uh, first is Noah, second is Abraham, and then he gave to the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. And then comes the last lesson, that is the new covenant, which is recorded in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 to 33. If you have to look into this passage, that is called as the new covenant. These passages are the first time of the Old Testament mentioned, which is referred as the new covenant. It is lodged in the context of Israel return from exile, and it talks about the blessings they will receive from God. Okay, let's turn the Bible. We have to read that one. It is so beautiful. This is very, if you can, possible, okay? Uh, Jeremiah, chapter 31. If I last time I preached on this, I guess, okay? Uh, Jeremiah, chapter 31, uh, verse 31 to 33. So beautifully said. You look into the, 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 the words we just been uh, uh, able to say. It says, Behold, the days cometh, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and with the house of Judah. Why is he saying new covenant? Because the old covenant people never respected him in any angle. And he didn't know how to go about it. And still he reinstated in every angle and said, Okay, I will want to make sure that, you know, I will reinstate that. And that's the reason he says I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And with the house of Judah. Verse 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and bring them out of the land of Egypt which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. So God is comparing himself as what? As husband. But in most 30 he says, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their inward part. Inward part. And write them in their hearts. And I and will be their God. And they shall be my people. Wow. I want to ask you this beautiful question to each one of us. Are we allowing God to fulfill these promises? Which means, are we allowing God to put his law and his statutes in my heart, mind and soul? The first covenant which was given in Mount Sinai was broken. And God is saying in the last days, no, I'm not going to give it in writing. Now their consciousness, consciousness will play an important role in order to make sure what? To keep my covenant relationship in every angle of life. New covenant. Again, if we have to look into the blessings being given. Hey, I ask you this question. I always wonder if God is there with us, who can be against us, right? Number one. Number two, if God is the one who is the creator of the whole earth and he is the one who is taking initiation in being with us. And no wonder the Bible says it very clearly in Revelation chapter 3 verse 20. Hear and stand at the door and knock. Who is adamant? Who is adamant? You and I are adamant are not allowing God to be able to be operative in our heart, mind and soul. Yes. Again. As in all the other instances, it is God who initiates the covenant and it is God who will fulfill by his grace. It is not by anything else, by his only, by his grace and by his love and by his mercy that his covenantial relationship is being fulfilled in every angle. Yes, 
the language there, God referred to himself as a husband to them. He talked about writing his law with their hearts and the using language from the Abrahamic covenant. He says that he will be their God and they will be his people. Thus, as before, the covenant is not just become legal binding agreement as in the courts of law today. It deals with something more. It is something more than a relationship. It is something much more than what he wants to offer to you and me. It is something much more than you and I can be able to perceive. And he simply says he goes beyond everything and anything. And he simply says that I want to be your husband. Hey man, who will reject this offer? Who will reject this offer? Can anyone reject this offer? No. And if anybody rejects this offer, what will be their fate? We are talking about that the covenant given to Noah and the covenant given to Abraham and the covenant was given at Sinai and people broke in every angle and Bible says it very clearly the first Old Testament promise in Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 31 to 33. He says, if you allow me to be a part of you, I will make sure that I will re-establish this covenant with you and bless you in every angle and provided that accept me as your husband. Yeah. Hey, a marriage proposal by God himself. What more could he do? I don't know. <laughs> yesterday, I was, uh, well, not yesterday, Thursday, uh, we are having a Bible study with one of the family. We were talking about, uh, uh, you know, Abraham telling Eliezer to go to, uh, you know, his own place and find a bride, okay, for Isaac. Uh, that is recorded in Genesis chapter 25. Uh, so what happens? He goes, he prays with the Lord. Isaac is there. Rebecca can't see Isaac where he is all about, right? When Eliezer came, that we are at well, he promised with God. God gave all the opportunity and showed Rebecca. Eliezer prays to God for twice and says, Thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. And then Rebecca takes Eliezer and the whole family to their house. That night they will stay. And he makes a covenant there uh, with Rebecca. Rebecca doesn't know who Isaac is all about. He has not seen. And today what happens in the marriage covenant? What happens in the Western world usually? How, 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 how do you have a, you know, a, a marriage proposal with them in this part of the land? How do you think so? You have any idea? Yeah, you should. I don't know how you are. You are all trending? Both trending? Okay. Uh, how many long years? I like your smile there. Only four years. Okay, so you knew everything about him, or he knew everything about you in the four years? No. Okay. And then you one, one, once you come to know, and then only you got friends, you know, you said, that. okay, fine. Beautiful, that's the way how it happens, right? We have to know each other until at this, okay, we know each other, we can never trust anybody, and you know, nobody gets married that way. But here in the Old Testament, Rebecca never saw who Isaac was at all about. But she left the house, you know, when the parents came. And they say, Lava, brother, okay, they came and said, now these people have come, they're asking, are you willing to go? What was the reply of Rebecca? I will. You see the contrast. Did Rebecca see Isaac? No. Did she know Isaac? No. How can this lady leave her family and go meet with the unknown person. Have you ever thought about it? Will that marriage work? What about Abraham? We are comparing and contrasting. When God said, Abraham, leave this place and go, do you know where he was going? What about Noah? Build an ark. Build an ark. It is going to rain. Did you see rain any time? No. no. Now God is telling in Jeremiah, I'm your husband. Can we be Rebecca? A solemn question to be asked by each one of us, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. 
the covenantial relationship that God has established with his children is for your benefit and my benefit, not for his benefit. You know, when Eliezer comes to Rebecca's house, Eliezer was talking about whom? Abraham. He was talking about Abraham. You read Genesis chapter 25, he was talking about, okay, uh, my master Abraham is so rich. Okay, I'm, my uh, Abraham's wife, okay, she bore okay, a child in an old age. And my master has so much of wealth. He was boasting about whom? Ah, you know who was Eliezer? He was the mediator between Rebecca and Abraham, right? You know, I put it in this way. The work of Eliezer is a mediator. So I put it in this way. And I would consider that Holy Spirit is the mediator between the bride and the bridegroom. That makes sense? How much of the Holy Spirit that we have been able to hear to and listen to this beautiful voice and say, the bridegroom and the bride, the Holy Spirit is in between. And that's the reason the Bible says it very clearly, do not grieve the Holy Spirit because he has saved you and me for the day of what? Eternity. I want to ask this question once again. God wants to be a husband. But can we be a Rebecca? I am willing to exercise the same faith and move forward the way how the Lord wants to. Yes, we have not seen God. But the thing is, have we been able to experience God through the Holy Spirit? That's more important. Yes, sir. Yeah, in a... In a in today's society, right? Uh huh. We, I think the the, the majority of us mm -hmm. base our relationship on love. Mm -hmm. You know, we will get to know someone, and first thing is attraction, and then you know, hopefully mm -hmm. we get to love that person. You know, mm -hmm. we wouldn't know everything. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, in those days, it was it was not that. It was like a, a commitment. A, mm -hmm. I don't know because I mean very difficult to pursue. There is a hand hand down uh -huh. while from you know someone dies, you know, um, and you would you you come in next, so uh -huh. you gotta take that, that mm -hmm. woman as your wife mm -hmm. and things like that. So you know, one thing that I learned from the old testament uh, principles is this. You know, today we have everything tangible. Everything we believe either it might be science or whatever it is, until unless we see, we don't believe, right? That's the way how it works out. Okay, we have to touch, we have to feel, we have to get things done. So when we have everything, why do you need faith? Is the question. Yeah. That makes sense when I say that? Why do we need faith? In those days, they never had anything. They only operated on faith. And you see with Abraham, and he took an oath from Eliezer and said, you will be able to get from the place where I have been born. And Barabi should be one of my relatives. And you see the oath that he has taken and he depended on God to fulfill that. What did Eliezer do? He depended on God to show him in every angle. You know, how many miles from the place where uh, uh, Abraham lived to come to? It was nearly a 10 days or 20 days journey on a camel. So what I mean to say is there's no letters, there's no mobile phones and call up and say, hey, this girl is looking so beautiful, her nose is so, uh, okay, I can take a photo, you know, Snapchat send you, and then you see her. So what happens with you and me? We only see and believe, but in a covenantial relationship with God and man, it is what is unseen. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, I took my marriage the way how it, I, 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 Okay, let me be uh, very honest with you. I'm not saying, okay, this is the way, but for me, I followed this biblical method and it worked in every angle. Right. This is what he said. Pray it down. God is ever willing to... I like the statement with the Bible every time, brother. You know, the Bible says, ask and it shall be given, right? <clears throat> Seek and it shall find, knock and it shall be open. What does it mean? And God, 
Jesus further goes on to say, stating that, I mean, when your child comes and asks you, fish, will you be able to give him uh, a snake? No. Bad people like you are wanting, uh, thinking to have good things for your children. Just imagine a good father like me. Don't you think so? I want to give you the best. Many a times, what we, we walk by sight and we become failures in every angle. That's what I believe very much. What happened to the children of Israel? We take the example of the Bible itself. We are, we are talking about the covenant relationship. God, in his own infinite mercy, got the children of Israel from where? From where? From Egypt. How many years were they, were they bondage? How many years were they bondage? 400 long years? Did God relieve them? Yes. Did they see the miracle hand of God? Yes. Did they enjoy manna? Yes. But when God wanted to re-establish this covenant by giving the Ten Commandments, uh, the 40 days of away, what were the children of Israel doing? They made a calf. What did they say? This calf is the one which got me all the way from Egypt till here. Man. I can't understand that part. You won't be afraid to accept that one. They experienced it in every angle. Um, can I make a point first? Sure, sure. Uh, so, um, just going through the lesson, and even when my husband and I were uh, discussing some aspects of it might be, we thought about, even when we were talking about Eliezer and him, make he was the go-between with that contract. But so many times we rely on that go-between person between us and God mm -hmm. to make the contract mm -hmm. and we not going straight to God because looking back, our two sons who we raised in the church, they are no longer in the church. And you know, we had worship, we brought them to church, to pathfinders and whatever. They are not in the church. Was it that we did not try for them to establish a relationship with God or we were just the go-between between we were the ones saying come on we're going to church and we're going to have worship now so as soon as they could get to the age where they could stop coming with us they stopped mm -hmm. and it's the same thing i'm looking on now with this covenant relationship with mm -hmm. god mm -hmm. these people who were able to get up mm -hmm. and leave their homes mm -hmm. they had a relationship with god mm -hmm. it wasn't that they were relying on someone else mm -hmm. to tell them about god mm -hmm. and that's what god wants to have with us so should i do this parenthood thing again and my prayer would would be for God to know my children and for my children to know God and not me going between them trying to break down who God is to them. Yeah, absolutely. That's a beautiful statement. Thank you very much. One thing is for sure is this. Let me be very honest with you. God has given this choices, right? When when a human being comes on, uh, to a certain uh, age, okay, when he understands mm -hmm. know what is right and wrong, okay, uh, how much ever you try to you know inculcate some good things or whatever whatever your upbringing bringing might be, you know, in a very beautiful sense, but still there are always the chances that our children might be able to go astray. Mm -hmm. Our children are never safe. Our children can be only saved by putting them into the hands of God. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing. Nothing else. Either they might be good, either they might be bad. I don't know what they're going to turn out. We don't know, including my children I'm talking about. We don't know how things are going to be. No, we try our level best to do, you know, the best as possible. Even God did the same thing. He yes. did his best to his children of Israel. Mm -hmm. But when they denied him, what could he do? And, and, and the Bible says it very What could I have done for Jerusalem as just like a hen? gathers a stick around. I did my level best, he says. What more could he do? Sometimes he also becomes so handicapped because of the power of choice. But one thing is for sure, if our children has been placed in the hand of God, one day or the other, Amen. like the prodigal son, God will not leave. Most probably make a choice, you go, consequences face, everything is fine, okay, and then there is inevitability that you have to turn back to God, there is no option at all. Most probably, that's the only way that how because human beings we have uh, we we like to learn lessons in a hard way. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm sorry. <laughs> Either me or you or anybody for that matter. But the beauty of this is this. God is like a husband. He has fallen in love with you and me. He has fallen in love with you and me. You know, read Song of Solomon. It's so beautiful. You know, who's the Shulamite? Solomon loved that lady very much, right? She was not beautiful at all, the way how it is explained. But still, Solomon was yearning to be with her. Just like that. The church, in no way, obliged with our Almighty in obedience. But still, God, in His own infinite mercy, loved this church in every act. Where I am, I want you to be also there. Amen. Plan of salvation. Just made a covenant. The fulfillment of the covenant depends on the two parties. He is willing. But the question is, are we willing to oblige or cooperate with heaven? If we can do that. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Any questions? Yeah, I just wanted to add something to yes. what um, Janice was talking about because um, in the past, I always believe that it takes a village, the, the African to the proper, it takes a village to raise a child and this way, this world that we're living right now is like villages are not participating as, as it used to in the past. So it's like we are left with our families, we have to do everything 100% from our homes, and even, and, you know, we, we, we really can't do it on our own. Mm -hmm. And we can't really take the blame for mm -hmm. when children do certain things, because we do our part. Mm -hmm. And the village, they go out to schools, they go out to different places, and they get influences everywhere. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, um, we all have to have a personal relationship with God, because even though we have worship at home, and we have, we worship with our spouses or whatever, we still have to find our own time with God, mm -hmm. personally in our own you know, little room, worshiping with him, mm -hmm. communicating with him mm -hmm. individually, mm -hmm. so that we can have that personal relationship with him. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. Uh, one thing that I can get for a little bit further and say is this, uh, what has happened with the whole world is we are in a mess. You know that, right? The whole world is in a mess, you know that? Yeah, we all are in a mess. Sometimes, there is a saying in psychology, it says, Brain drain is better than brain in drain. You got that? No, could you repeat that? Brain drain is brain better. Drain. Brain okay. drain is better than brain in drain. Brain in brain in drain. Oh, the brain drain is better than. Brain drain. Brain you gotta write drain. that down. I have to write that down. <laughs> I, I got okay. a brain drain. At least it's not in the drain. Oh. Uh, brain okay. drain is better than brain in the drain. Oh, oh, okay. You got it? Okay. Okay. So which means what has happened with the world is we are brain in drain. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Which means during the time of antidulence, what did God say? The world is in a mess. And that's the reason he wanted to. Why wow? Does it make sense? Now what is happening here? <laughs> the whole world is in mess. Mm -hmm. but we don't Economic know. problem. Who should solve the problem? Why don't you solve the problem? <laughs> the whole earth has to run that straining. Coronavirus. Who should solve the problem? Scientists? Johnson and Johnson, AstraZeneca, and uh, who will, you know, they are the gods now at the moment, okay? Now, if, if, if just uh, two days, yesterday, there was a, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, 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 that lava, volcano, okay, volcano, four miles erupted, the previous one, nine miles erupted, what is the problem? Who is going to solve? Politicians, scientists, doctors, and everybody are trying their level best. The CDC director is pleading on everybody's been oh, please, if we can do this, we can do this, we can do. No, we are limited. The only solution is just like the time of anti is the world has to be wiped. Everybody is in a mess. Everybody are trying to fix the problem, but nobody can fix the problem. 
there has to be a wiping away and that's the reason when you see these things are happening the bible says it very clearly my time is near i'm coming soon and either it might be your child my child we all are in a mess we try our level best to get them impossible so god he says i have to wipe out and that's the time that we are living nobody can fix this mess only he can and that's the reason he's calling us i have a plan of that Please, please, please obey. It is for your benefit. It is not for my benefit. It is for your benefit. Noah obeyed. Abraham obeyed. Rebecca obeyed. In the last day, what is our response? For our church? This is the question. Worried about our family? The only thing that you can do is kneel down and pray and plead on their behalf. That's all. Nothing more you can do. Honestly. And God finds mercy and your prayers have been answered. Yes. Your child will be there. So Pastor, we, we talk about the, like, like, um, but I mentioned the, the, the community, right? Uh-huh. So if we say in the world is a mess, so that means like, like the church should be the community. <laughs> and somehow like that not working. You know, it's 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 really sad um to look we, we could look at a church like for instance we belong to mm -hmm. a, a huge mm -hmm. church, mm -hmm. a big church. Mm -hmm. And besides that church we've been around a lot of big churches mm -hmm. and we have known and seen young people mm -hmm. grow up in a church, come into church mm -hmm. and I'm telling you right now it's like the majority of them, mm -hmm. as they reach a certain age, like all of them gone. Mm -hmm. When I was when I was coming up, I think mm -hmm. I I could see a lot of us kind of hang around the church and stay around and get older and whatever. But like right now, mm -hmm. I don't know if we're doing something wrong in the church. Mm -hmm. Good question. But every one of them mm -hmm. is like every last one of them gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no matter how. Tied the the the, the 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 look like it seems to be tied with what the organization in the church was going on, the involvement in things. Mm -hmm. But as they reach that point in their life, mm -hmm. the only thing that I would say might be a little sarcastic, do. but uh, let me be very honest with you. I say, don't train up your child in the way how the church wants to. Mm -hmm. Number one, number two. Church is limited in every angle, but Christ is unlimited. Make our children to grow in Christ, not in church. You know why? Church becomes so performance oriented. I tell you again and again. Again and again. In the big churches, in all the churches, where would we be talking about? Okay, we have become performance oriented, monumental. Wow, my sang sang so beautifully. Wow, your child sang so beautifully. Wow, good. So what happens? What is happening with a child is what? Performance oriented. You want some applaudance in every angle. So he does things for what? Most probably, I don't know. I might be mistaken. That is the way how the church is hiding in every angle. Performance oriented. But Christ oriented is entirely different from performance oriented. Humbleness, diligence, not self seeking. No, you do it. Either it, it should be acceptable for God, not in humanity. So, what I'm going to say is the church is going in a different direction altogether. And that's what Ed White says. Eh? Be careful. We feed on the word of God, not feed on what the church says. No. That's what I'm trying all my level best to make sure feed with the word of God. Our children should be fed with the word of God. Not to the standard of church, but the standard of Christ. Christ. Amen. If that happens, I think so. There might be a lot of uh, you know, changes might be able to happen. Yeah. And, and I always um, 
claim the promise in Isaiah 49, 25. Amen. I will contend with them that contend with me and I will save your children. Mm -hmm. So we have to keep Amen. Amen. To that Amen. promise. And I, and I promise you in the name of Jesus today, if you have kept your children in the hands of God, wherever they go, they will, I will come back to you. You have done your part? Praise God. Leave the rest to God. God will take care of in everything. Amen. Okay? Amen. Amen. Okay, so uh, we will just conclude uh, with a word of prayer and, uh, and then we can be able to get it. Gracious God in heaven, thank we thank you for all the blessings of life. Jesus. I want to thank you for the wonderful lesson of Father with a covenantial relationship to be a part of you. Many times you have failed, but in this last moment, edge of time, help us not harden a heart, oh Father. Help us to heed, cooperate with heaven. So that we might enjoy being in relationship with you. May your name be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.